Today's lesson is from 2 Corinthians. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The word of the Lord. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. For you have glorified your name and your word above all things. All the kings of the earth will praise you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. Though the Lord be high, he cares for the lowly. He perceives the haughty from afar. The Lord will make good his purpose for me. O Lord, your love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. Then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, would you come and speak to our hearts through your word in Christ's name. Amen. Do be seated. We are in uh, the over here. We're in the end of our fiscal year, and at the same time, at the very beginning of ordinary time. So the two kind of overlap, which is so helpful, um, so that we can take uh, things that we, as a church, churches all around, like to focus on and view them through the lens of uh, the teachings of Jesus and Scripture and also through the normative pattern of the church. And um, this today, you're going to hear from me and from Bill, um, and we're going to be talking about the subject of time, not just time, but availability, which is probably the most costly thing uh, we have today, isn't it? So children, in your activity bags, uh, you will find... Uh, one or two sheets of blank paper, and I would love for you to use that paper to draw or to write a story or something about what you're looking forward to doing this summer. 
Um, I loved, who was it that drew the picture of sharks uh, last week? That was awesome. I put that, uh, I put that up on my, uh, my wall, so that's great. Uh, so yeah, feel free to draw about sharks, although if you swim with sharks, that may be dangerous. So let's turn to our passage. We're going to be looking very briefly at Psalm 138. So it's in your bulletin. Just pull it up there. Um, and uh, let's have a look. And I want to talk about availability in two, uh, two sides. First is, this psalm is all about our, uh, what happens when we make ourselves available to God. Um, and why talk about being available to God? It's kind of a different way of, of addressing a relationship, isn't it? Because you could be in a relationship with someone and uh, fill it with so many busy activities that you're not actually available. You're there, but there's no connection point. And I, I first heard this about 19 years ago. I was at a church meeting, smaller than this. There's there about 20 of us in the basement of a church called Holy Trinity Brompton. Um, and Nikki Gumbel, who is the pioneer of the Alpha Course, was doing a talk to these uh, to us, and he spoke on this very subject, and he, he led with this, which hit me between the eyes. He said, God loves you unconditionally, he loves you wholeheartedly, and he loves you con continually. Think about that for a moment. God loves you unconditionally, no, condition, no strings attached. He loves you wholeheartedly. Not only has he invested his whole heart into his relationship with you, he's completely available to you at all times and continually. So he gave this great talk. Then he finished. He, he, we got to chatting. He came up, and he was, it was a time of prayer like we had a few weeks ago. And he said to me, David, do you believe that God approves of you? And I think my lack of response kind of conveyed the, the answer that was otherwise, that I didn't quite believe in that. I could understand that he loved me. I could understand that, you know, other things that his son had died for me, but that he approved of me. Uh, so I didn't really say anything. And he said this. He said, you know, Dave, we all know that we all have things, and we know things about ourselves that can, that can make it difficult to believe that God approves of us. But God wants you to know that he approves of you. And he wants you to know that he loves you unconditionally, wholeheartedly, and continually. And that's true tonight. That's true for you today. And our psalm speaks of that. And if you look down, uh, Psalm 138 to Psalm 145 are the, the final collection of psalms attributed to David. And so the enemies that David speaks about here are not the bear and the lion that he killed as a shepherd boy. The enemies he speaks of here are not of Saul, who kind of lost his mind and kept trying to put a spear through him while he was leading worship. Uh, you know, that's why there are no spears as props on the front. So Becky never has to worry about, you know, dodging a spear in flight. Um, the enemies here are much closer. We don't know it, but could he be thinking of his son Absalom, who led an insurrection to try to have his father killed and deposed from the throne? whose life was lost? Could he be thinking of his other son with an unpronounceable name who tried to usurp Solomon? Um, Chris could give us the, the name if I asked him, but anyway, we'll just leave it at that. So the enemies that David is speaking about here are very personal. It's very up close. It's very difficult. And yet David is saying this. I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? I give thanks. I give you thanks, O Lord, in verse 1, with my whole heart. So he's responding to the, the way the Lord has made himself wholeheartedly available to David. David responds with a wholehearted response. And the, the first three verses give us really the theme of the, the psalm. It's about giving thanks because on the day I called out, you answered me. Thank you. The message says this. I love this. Thank you. Everything in me says thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness. Our culture is in a very interesting moment right now, which is promoting this message that says that love is God. And yet the scriptures tell us a slightly different version, which is that God is love. 
And we know perfect love has been made known to us in the flesh, in Jesus. God is loving and faithful in answering our prayers. And in verse 3, the psalm echoes, When I called, you answered me. You made me bold and stout-hearted, which makes me think of hobbits and the Lord of the Rings. Um, and then in verse 4 to 6, we have this incre incredible dis description of who God is. It says, the Lord is high, and he looks on the lowly. So this very personal experience of God, help, God's help is now put in perspective. The God whom the singer is talking about is epic. He's universal. He's the Lord to whom all one day will bow down to. He's the one that even the kings of the earth, the modern day rulers, will give him thanks. And yet, he's not inaccessible. He comes to the lowly. He comes to the humble. And then verses 7 and 8 say this. In this life, we will face trouble. It'll be sickness, it'll be opposition, it'll be temptation, it'll be exhaustion, trials, and attacks. It's just going to come. And what's so encouraging here is that God in his love and faithfulness preserves us. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. And the Lord will fulfill the great, one of the great verses of the, of the Old Testament, in my opinion, is this in verse 8. The Lord will fulfill his pur purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. So it says here, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. God and his love and faithfulness has a purpose for all of our lives. And he will fulfill that purpose. Human love can be fleeting, but your, Lord, your love, O oh Lord, endures forever. So that's great, isn't it? A song of an individual. That's how it was written. And then the people of Israel get it utterly wrong, and they get sent into exile to be taught, once again, what it means to be dependent on the living God. And all of a sudden, these songs that were of an individual towards the God become the songs of a community. So that this psalm would read, We give you thanks, O Lord, with our whole heart. Before the gods, we sing your praise. We bow down. There's a corporate nature that comes on. And so it conveys this message then that, I don't know, sometimes I get a feeling that if I pray really hard and I read a lot of the Bible, maybe if I memorize scripture, then God will answer my prayers more quickly. But the problem is, is that in the New Testament, there really isn't a definition of a Christian who's not in community. And so often, what happens is, is that we need to be available to those around us, which is hard because we have to be willing to receive from others, or we have to be willing to be available to others. A wild thing happened. I, I didn't think it was the Lord at first, so I ignored it for a few weeks, which is at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, I've really sensed the Lord tell me to start walking to work. And I work downtown. And I had a, a great truck. Um, but we had a friend, you know, it's a long story, eventually. So for a year, I took the dart downtown. I walked a mile, got on the train, walked another mile to All Saints. It was, a, it was incredible in that um, it made me so much more available. I met people I would never have met, and, but I had to slow down. And my prayer became, Lord, help me move in an unhurried way through a busy day. It's interesting, isn't it? And I, I learned so much from it. But this thing about being available to God is being willing to receive, first and foremost, his whole hearted, unconditional, continual love. And once we begin to receive his from, from him in that way, we then become able to be available to those around us. 
being available to the community of faith is a mindset change. So we're not going to ask you to give of your time today. Because I think Jesus is inviting us into being something much greater. I'm not even going to say, we're not really going to invite you to volunteer at the church. Because that kind of maybe has some baggage for some of you. But I think the invitation by Jesus is to come and be part of a movement that is going to change the face of East Dallas. I have had no part, no role in coming up with your vision and values. Yet if you go to our website and you read this, and if you think, what would, it, what would happen if people intentionally leaned into this as you have been and continue to do so, and, and this begins to grow and to grow, then things will look very differently. Why? Because being available to a community means that when we come together, we have an outward-looking desire to pour strength into each other's hearts. It means that when we're stood, watching our children in the playground over there, and, you know, interjecting when fights break out or potty language becomes a little too, too much, it's almost like we have an antenna up where we're prone in the event that the Lord has placed us there to actually be the answer to someone else's prayer. Just by being ourselves. And out of our own situation, lifting our eyes up to the Lord and lifting our eyes up to the left and to the right. Because a kingdom mindset is one that looks to connect. And if we're unconditionally, wholeheartedly, and continually loved, then we are significant. Then it's, we don't just talk about plans. We use a term that, still trying to figure out what it means, because it has an epic nature to it. Epic is in the real sense of the word. And that's the word destiny. That there's actually a destiny. There's a plan that has been put in place by the one who's so high for us who are so lofty so that during our lives, great, incredible things would take place. Lives would be changed. We're no longer ourselves. We become destiny helpers. We're God's people placed at the right time and in the right way to assist those who are crying out in verse 8. Lord, would you fulfill your purpose for me? Some of you have been praying that. And it may be that the answer to those prayers would be fulfilled by the people two rows behind or three in front. We've been asked many times since joining here, why, how did you come to Dallas? And really, the answer is one guy's name, Paul Sorensen. He leads a church in Daniel Island. And when Philip Jones accepted the call to move to All Saints, it left a vacancy at St. Andrews in Little Rock. And Paul was the kind of friend who's really a liability. And Paul, if you're watching, you know that's true. Uh, because he applied for the job, filled in the application form, submitted my resume to the search committee, and didn't tell me. So that two weeks after Thomas was born, our middle child, I got this call on the phone of sat in Starbucks from someone with an accent I couldn't understand. He's from Arkansas. And it's just, I, 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 if you're from Arkansas, you know what I mean. It was like a really, it was beautiful, but I'd never heard it before. And uh, obviously it didn't work out because I didn't actually apply. But Paul kept sticking his head out and acting in faith and kept putting me in touch with people to a point where I had to tell him to say, I had to say, Paul, stop. It's too much. You're more interested in my next job than I am. And they said, well, keep an open mind because the bishop's joining this phone call. And all of a sudden, Philip Jones was on the phone call. And I'd never really talked to someone from Texas. And you've heard him speak. It's an interesting accent. He said, have you ever thought about moving to Dallas? And would you like to come visit and explore what ministry in Dallas would look like? I said, Philip, love you to meet you, but no. It's great, but no, we have no interest in coming to Dallas. We've never heard of it. I'm going to Canada, and well, eventually we came and visited, and we moved here. Paul was a very unique type of destiny helper for the Larley family because he was the link in the chain that got us to Dallas, which was God's plan all along. And then we arrived, and the kids had no school to go to. We arrived on the 13th of December 
It was Christmas Day. Rachel had been praying, Lord, we need to get the, the children into a preschool. And uh, we were out at the park, and we met Mrs. Chatham, who taught at a Mother's Day Out over in Lakewood at Northridge uh, Child Development Center. And she and Rachel got talking, and she said, you know, we have an opening in the school. I've seen your son Ethan play. He passes the assessment. He could start, uh, you know, the first Monday in January. And the whole week, we're looking at the life of Elvis. I thought, we've come to the promised land. <laughs> you know, she, Mrs. Chatham may have thought she just went to the park because her grandchildren were visiting. And she did. But her, she, Mrs. Chatham being herself led to us stepping into such an important part of what God had for us because now Rachel teaches at that school. Our three boys have gone to that school. And others have, 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 have now come to work there because of connections that Rachel's had. See, the Lord weaves it all in beautifully. And so being available to God, you know, it's connecting with him. It's finding whatever works. Being available to each other is really about stepping out of our comfort zone and giving others more time and thought. And I'm not saying you aren't already doing this. Because I don't know if you are or not, because I don't really know you all that yet that well yet. But this is the invitation that Jesus is making. He's inviting us to lock arm and arm to run a race together so that we're looking to strengthen each other. It's a vision of a church that's more like a movement. It's about a community that is committed together of moving deeper in their knowledge of God, closer together, and then further out into society. And so it's not about giving your time, though your time will be asked. Jesus isn't asking you to give your time. He's inviting you, and he's issuing you really an invitation to be intentionally available. Available to him and to his people. The dangerous, not the dangerous, the challenging thing is realizing that because you're wholeheartedly loved, you're unconditionally loved, and you're continually loved, there's incredible significance in your life. And some of us have just never been told that. But the truth is, he's inviting us to embrace our own significance and realize that all of our natural abilities, all of our acquired skills, and all of our spiritual gifts have been brought together in a community for such a time as this to empower, to empower each other so that as we're able and as God leads, we become not only the answer to each other's prayers and fulfill in some way, God's the answer, but we become his hands and feet. So practically, what does that look like? I'm going to ask Bill to come help me out. Would you give a round of applause to the Reverend Bill Burns? <laughs> Bill, in front of everyone, I want to... Uh -oh. I want to thank you for all that you do. We say that Bill's a member of staff, but he's actually a volunteer, and he is the one who coordinates a lot of this behind the scenes. And so, Bill, on behalf of everyone at St. Bart's, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for all that you do. My pleasure. So, Bill, everyone's seen the Tex-Mex truck arrive, so our time's been reduced. So awesome. it's there. It's setting up. We will not have a repeat of our first night. But tell us, how long have you been coming to St. Bart's? So I've actually been at St. Bart's since the very beginning, which I guess is six years ago. Is that right, Chris? Um, it was just about a year after I had come to All Saints. Um, so I've been here from the beginning, been excited about uh, St. Bart's from the beginning, and, and love our vision and values. I'm very glad about that. Uh, let me ask you, what are you thankful to God for about the church, about this community here at St. Bart's? So one of the things that I noticed really from the beginning, and this actually came up in our very first pastorates meeting all the way back at the beginning of the life of the church, which was it was interesting to hear how many people um, in our pastorate had um, come from painful church experiences. And you may know that one of our values is that we value our church being a place of healing. 
Um, and so many, I think, of us have, been, have had church experiences where we've been wounded, where we have felt hurt, where maybe even we feel alienated from God and from the love that Dave was talking about. And coming to, uh, coming first to All Saints and then here to St. Bart's, I, I was struck the very first Sunday by that line in the prayer at the, at the end of the service where we say, thank you for accepting us into your family, because that's exactly what it felt like, um, that this is a place where from priests, staff, each other, everyone feels like this is a place where you're welcome. We're glad you're here. This is not a place of judgment. This is a place where you can experience God's love. And that has been a powerful force of healing in my life, and I think in the lives of many other folks here too. Now, nine to five, Bill, what do you do? I work as a licensed professional counselor. Raise a hand if you're a counselor. We've got like a thousand of them in the church. Uh, they're all on vacation right now. No, you got thank you. Yeah. Um, tell me. So you oversee a lot of the teams that, that are used on a Sunday. How many people does it take to pull off a liturgical service such as ours? So it's been interesting coming back from the pandemic because we've, as you can kind of sense, those of you who have been here for a while, we're ramping back up. Um, and so you may think, well, there's just a few folks leading worship, um, someone reading the scripture passage, uh, a few ushers. It actually, once we have everything going, it takes about 30 people on any given Sunday. Um, and on some of those things you see, but a lot of those things you don't see, uh, people who set up the altar, uh, people who... Uh, work in children's ministry, so many of you have children, you get to see those folks. Again, if, if you're relatively new, you haven't seen our children's ministry in action, but we are ramping that back up and we'll be starting this summer. So from, for all those various ministries, on any given Sunday, including hopefully soon we'll have prayer teams in the back who will be available to pray for folks during communion, there's about 30 people on any given Sunday who are part of making the service happen and making it be uh, the experience that we all look forward to. And so um, what I love, just kind of the way you've made it, is what's great is when visitors come or, or people come and join us here at St. Bart's, so much has gone in to prepare a place for them to be able to just step in and, in, and encounter God. And so um, if somebody wanted to be a part of that, what would be the first step? It's a great question. And if I can just piggyback off of what you just said. Yeah. As a counselor, a lot of the times the metaphor I think about is my job is to create a space for someone to be able to come with everything that's going on in their lives, with all their hopes and dreams, all their hurts, all their questions, and just to create space for them. And that's exactly what we hope to do is to create space for all of us to be able to worship together uh, as a church family. Um, if you're interested in helping out, there's lots of different ways you can do that. Um, our goal is never that it would be burdensome that you would have the opportunity to serve maybe once a month or once every two months. Um, and there's a lot of different teams. Some, again, are visible. Some are behind the scenes. If you're interested, again, you don't have to make any commitments, but if you're interested and want to know more, um, there's actually a box on the back of the worship guide that says, I'm interested in serving at St. Bart's. You can just check that box. You're not making any kind of a commitment but that will just essentially notify me that someone is interested, and I'll send you an email to tell you a little bit more about the various teams that we have and kind of what's already up and running now and how you can get involved if you're interested. Bill, thank you. My pleasure. Right. Way to make a point. That was great. Bill Burns, everyone. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Yeah, that wasn't just Bill. The microphone's actually slightly dodgy, as they'd say. Uh, so before we close and move on to praying and the creed and everything, this is the big thought. The Lord loves you. He loves us as a church wholeheartedly, unconditionally, and continually. And it's no accident that you're here tonight. It's no accident that he has drawn us all here for such a time as this. Um, and maybe because of the food promised afterwards, and that's okay. You know, we're not above using bribery to get people here. But what we'd love to do, though, is facilitate a way for you, wherever you are in your faith journey, to keep taking those steps closer to him, to understanding who Jesus is. Uh, here at St. Bart's, 
whether it's through public theology or wherever else, we say the, the mind is best used like a parachute, open and deployed. And so we love questions. We love to talk. We love to have coffee with you. So if there's any, ever any way we could serve you in that way, it'd be uh, a joy to do so. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the, the words of this song. 